Hey, it's Natalie with Your Rad Life, and today we'll be talking with writer Norman Olstead. I met with him at his office in Santa Monica to talk about his latest book, Gravity. Norman Olstead's newest book, Gravity, picks up where his first memoir, Crazy for the Storm, leaves off. In Crazy for the Storm, Norman is just 11 years old, the sole survivor of a plane crash that claimed three lives, including his father's. Fast forward nine years, Norman is now 20, and Gravity takes place in St. Anton, a ski town in the Austrian Alps, where Norman skied with his dad as a young boy. Yeah, well, um, so Crazy for the Storm is, is really a tribute to my father. I wanted to write about the person that influenced me most in my life and just really forge my point of view on the world and how to live. And um, he was a very interesting guy. He grew up in a poor neighborhood uh, in South L.A. And um, was a child actor. He was in Cheaper by the Dozen, like the oldest son of the original Cheaper by the Dozen. And he was on Sky King and on these TV shows and stuff. And that's how he put himself through UCLA. And when he finished law school, UCLA Law, he joined the FBI in 1960. Real gung-ho, Hoover, you know, stopping all the bad guys kind of thing. He was a 50s guy, in a way. And uh, within a year, he was disillusioned with how Hoover was running that guy as a sort of corrupt, personal little police force. And he quit and he wrote a book that came out in 1967, taking on Hoover and his tactics. Now, that's like writing a book about, uh, well, I mean, there's no equivalent anymore because Hoover was the most powerful man in America. He had something on everybody, nobody touched him. And my dad was one of the first people to write a book and come out and talk about uh, Hoover's corruption. And Hoover said, oh, well, you know, this Olstead guy, he's obviously part of the KGB. It sounds funny now, but the equivalent now would be, hey, he's part of Al-Qaeda. Right, right. And everybody was like, oh. So my dad had to defend himself. And Hoover luckily had nothing on my dad. So, and, uh, yeah. so he was able to defend himself. And um, I was born the same year the book came out, 1967. Apparently there was all these... Uh, FBI agents down on Topanga Beach where I was born, which was a full hippie crazy thing. So everybody knew who they were because they just couldn't break the mold. Right. <laughs> the phones were tapped. My mom always talks about how you hear all these clicks on the phone. And I was born in right away. Uh, my dad started me surfing and skiing. And he took me surfing down in Mexico where his parents had retired. We would do surf safaris down there. Uh, one of which I wrote about in the book Crazy for the Storm, which was the kind of uh, the most wild one I put in there. I should say that was a great story about delivering a washing machine to my grandparents. We drove it down the back of this truck that my father borrowed from his cousin. This brings me to the question, um, what were your grandparents like? How was he raised? Was he sort of raised in this like uh, extreme environment where you're... No. Okay. No, I think my grandfather was real quiet, didn't talk a lot. Okay. And my grandmother was the pistol. You know, okay. she she made my father do, you know, learn tap and ballet. And, because in those days, to, to be in the movies, you had to sing and dance and right. you know all the different skills. So she was the one that gave him the passion and the fire. I think he always kind of resented that. He just wanted to play baseball. Okay. But... Later on, obviously realized, oh, it all paid off. Right. And so he did that sort of same technique with me, uh, basically just, you know, just taking me all over surfing and skiing, just pushing me into situations and helping me through them, which ultimately then saved my life. The plane groping through the fog heading for a ski resort in the mountains above Los Angeles went down yesterday morning. For hours, helicopters searched for the wreckage and survivors. As it turned out, there was only one, 11-year-old Norman Olstad. His father and the pilot killed in the crash. Another passenger, Sandra Cressman, killed as she and the boy slid down a hillside. You know, I never gave up. My dad never taught me never to give up. <laughs> They couldn't get the radar guys at the control tower, and they didn't know what was going on. And then suddenly we just saw these trees and crashed. And I just, I tried to wake my dad up, couldn't get him, or the pilot. Young Norman and Sandra, 30, figured they could not survive the night, so they tried to get down the mountainside. It 
at the top, it was really icy, and Sandra was trying to too, but she had a broken arm, and um, and she then she slipped, and I tried to stop her, but she went right over me. And I saw that she was really badly hurt, you know. I thought, oh no. But then after a while, I knew I was going to make it. That's kind of why, why when I was 20, I left UCLA and went back to St. Anton, Austria in the Alps, where I had been with my father as a boy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote the book Gravity, because I, I went back there to kind of test myself now as an adult. Like, what do I have? That's why I went alone. Right. You know, what am I? You know, that's the time in your life you're really like, who am I? What am I? What am I made of? And it was more emotionally intense than I expected it to be. Because I got there and people remembered my father well, and he had sort of lived this great, we'd go there for a month at a time, and he would just live this other life, you know, skiing all day, and playing music at night, and playing poker, and he just kind of, you know, it was like this little magical escape that he had. So I went there, and sort of unconsciously, I wanted to see if I could do that tip. Right. And it was hard at first. You know, it was not easy. It didn't just come to me. I didn't have the same kind of charisma that he had, and um, and, and was more self-conscious than him. And he didn't care about being rejected or handsome. <laughs> so I, I kind of go out at night and try to meet other guys and skiing. I try to, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. And um, I eventually, it was Christmas Day. I heard about this Swedish ski bum party where they were going to break into the Kaltenberg Hütte, and. Um, I kind of knew where that was, and I got a map because I had skied by it when I was a kid, and I knew it was just I heard about it. So I knew it was towards Steuben, actually towards this town Langen, but near this other little village, Steuben. And I headed out that way, and I got caught in, in a blizzard. Right. And um, stupidly, I was alone. I mean, I just I broke Rule every rule. <laughs> you know, just right. do that. I got I. I set off a little avalanche. I mean, it was an intense journey to get to this party, and I got there. And the head, I always called him the number one ski bum because he was the guy everybody respected. He was this Danish skier, kind of bulky, boxer looking guy, and great skier. Right. And, you know, right away they were upset that I was there and that I'd come alone because ski bums were, had been arrested for going out of bounds and then creating avalanches, or when a ski bum goes and gets killed, like I told you, it's bad press. Right. And there's all these problems. So the others, the head ski bums like that, they didn't like the wild ski bums because they were too wild because it was bad for them and then people wanted to kick them out of the town. I mean, I know that at one season they didn't let Swedish ski bums in the town. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, I, I know how to ski, but I was from LA and I was like, you know, long haired surfer guy. They had long hair too, but it's just a different thing. Yeah. I just couldn't believe that I could ski. Is that Even if I'd go up on the mountain and ski, but they just didn't want to see it. Right. But it was enough that I got next to him and I skied and I held my own through the trees. I mean, he kind of left me in the dust in some ways because he was so strong and the snow was fucked up. It was still early in the season and it wasn't great coverage. You had to be careful. But I made it and I made it down with him. And at the end, we were in the train station waiting for the train having a beer and we could get these big two liter things. Maybe it's one thing, whatever it was, this big thing to do. And he said to me, nice turn. So there's this whole like adventure part, but then there's this whole like coming of age to get life story. Yeah, so she had this, this, this scarf, and she had the long hair, and she had these moccasin shoes on, and just really reminded me of Topanga. So I just had this immediate like, wow, who is this? Right. So then we started talking. Okay. I just met her, I just turned and there she was and I waited for her to walk down and uh, we started talking it was the first time I had ever been in love. I had never been in love like that. Okay. It took me a long time, 20, 20 years old, but uh, and it reminded me of, in some ways of that feel I had with my father, just that connection, that kind of really deep, intense thing. Yeah. You know, this was different because of the romantic love. Right. But there was something similar for me. Somebody who I was really enamored of, and uh, and she was just really smart and interesting, kind of. Yeah, and okay. because of her, you say that that's what opened you up to meet your wife, and yeah. it's uh, sort of like full circle. Yeah, you're back 
in California. You're in Santa Monica or Venice? Venice. In yeah. Venice, yeah. Walking my dog and I run into her, much like how I ran into the Danish girl. Right? Lena. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just this kind of thing where we ran into each other. And but now I'm older and I've been through a, a, a dysfunctional marriage. I got a kid. Right. And um, or I should say just a marriage that didn't work out. Yeah. Very yeah. short two year thing, but I have this great son and I've had a lot of life behind me and I run into this person and think I don't wanna I know this is a great opportunity because I've lived long enough to know right. when one comes along. And so it happens a lot as well. And did you find it was easier to write this than Crazy for the Storm? Like the length of this is much shorter. It's really, um, like you said, it's just Well, it's kind of, easier emotionally, yeah. Yeah. It's easier. When I wrote Crazy for the Storm, I had sore throats every day. That are, uh, just I had a psychosomatic reaction. This. Uh, well, I had some pretty rough days because there was some pretty intense stuff in it, but it wasn't like that. And um, I enjoyed finding this other little voice where Crazy for the Storm is a bit of this young boy looking back through an adult's eyes. Yeah. There's a certain voice. And this, I was able to find a voice which I really enjoyed, which is a little bit more irreverent. It has a little bit more resistance to everything most people want and accept, yep. which I find um, it's important to keep that voice alive because I look around and I think, God, oh, I'm really just so happy with all this and what they're told to be happy with. And, right. And I didn't feel that way when I was 20. Yeah. I kind of was thought, I was suspicious of it all. How are you different as a dad uh, from your dad? I think he just, the difference is it wasn't a reflective self-conscious time. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah. wasn't going, okay, if I do this, well, how will it? It's, it's a great like, way to put look, it. If he surfs, it'll give him a great thing to do. The ocean's amazing. You can surf all over the world. And on some level, he's totally right. Yeah. We really waste a lot of time with all that BS. But at the same time, I don't do it that way. I mean, I push when I can. It's like a, it's a little bit of an art. You're a parent. Yeah. You push a little, you don't. You let them make a mistake. You kind of, So I'm dancing. Okay. See, my dad. That's the difference. My dad wasn't trying to make me the best. Right. He just wasn't. He, what was important to him was that I do it. Right. And just doing it, you have this whole, all these experiences, and you learn about yourself. And you, I mean, not that he was thinking he was going to learn about us, but just he knew. Look, it's good to just do it. Yeah. And just throw your hat in the ring, do it, scrap it out, and you'll end up getting a great way or having a great powder run or whatever. And if you play the cello, turn your kid onto that. Yeah. And they'll have this incredible ecstatic moment that can happen with the music. So it, that's all it needs to do. Come down from your tower.